Thank you, Team ETHR, for um, having a, giving us this opportunity to be in the first inaugural session of this webinar. And, and uh, the topic that you've chosen, facing the changes in work landscape post-COVID-19, is very interesting because there's so many talks and webinars mm -hmm. going around about COVID, etc. So this post-COVID is also important. And uh, I have an illustrious uh, panel members, um, uh, very uh, experienced. Uh, I'll briefly introduce each one of them, and I'll go in alphabetical order so that we do not have any issue with gender uh, bias on this call. <laughs> <Ma>. <laughs> so a um, uh, pleasure in introducing Adesh Goel. He is the global CHR for Tata Telecommunication. 35 years long experience. Doesn't look it when you look at him. And uh, good thing about him that he's been a very hard um, connected person with people. His, his uh, reputation in engaging with people both in Tata Telecom and other companies like Hughes that he has worked has been outstanding. Um, as a, besides this, he is also a certified uh, teacher in meditation and happiness program at um, AOL Art of Living. The uh, second panel member is uh, Mahalakshmi. She is the CHRO for Mondelez India. I think it's better known as Cadbury's because Mondelez is an unusual name, but Cadbury's and Oreo um, are the products. And she has 23 years long experience in both consulting and business HR role. Um, she was uh, with Airtel at earlier, Anderson, Ernst & Young, and Hewitt. And um, one very remarkable thing about her is that last year she was the winner of the Women's Leader of the Year by Business World. So you can see how illustrious the panel is. Our third panel member is Raj Raghavan. He's a senior VP HR with Indigo Airlines. And prior to that, he was uh, Amazon's head of HR for Asia, Pacific, and Middle East. In fact, it was during Raj's time that Amazon set up its entire operation in India in a very big way and expanded. And um, Raj has had some illustrious companies to his credit in 30 years of experience. Uh, he has worked with um, Unilever, with um, um, Ford Motors, and HSBC prior to his current career. Um, our next uh, um, uh, panel member is uh, Sukhjit Singh uh, Pasricha. He is currently the CHRO um, um, of uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank. And you'll notice there's a lot of variety of industry that this panel represents in today's discussion. So, um, and um, 25 years long experience, both in B2B as well as B2C uh, organizations. Prior to Kotak uh, Bank, he was um, with uh, Bajaj Finance and uh, also at Indigo and Bharti Airtel and PepsiCo and Spice uh, Communication. Um, my name is Akhil Basrai. Uh, I spent uh, 47 years in HR with uh, Unilever in India, Kenya and um, Motorola in Asia Pacific countries, Shell in Malaysia and IBM in India. And um, I was privileged to be the national president of um, National HRD Network. Incidentally, Raj is the national treasurer for the National HRD Network. So with this introduction, you can uh, gauge the depth and the quality of experience that this panel brings to you. The format that we've decided is slightly different than other webinars. Uh, uh, we don't want to go into question answers straight away. So each one of us will share at least two thoughts, two major thoughts on this subject in less than three minutes. And again, we'll go in the alphabetical order. So since Adesh spells his name with AA, -A, he's always first. So Adesh, to you, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Akhil. And hello, everyone on the panel. And uh, hello to all the listeners. You know, the biggest joke going around for the last few days, uh, that who did the digital transformation? Was it the CEO, was it the CTO, or was it COVID-19, right? And the answer is very clear. What COVID-19 did, you know, we could not have ever imagined. Now, uh, you know, for us, the you know, we had only about 2% of our 19,000 employees uh, working primarily from home pre-COVID. And within two weeks, we went from 2% to 98%. Um, and that was the most amazing part. Uh, without any 
significant glitch without dropping any ball. Uh, so what that tells us is that you know remote working is possible, and you know uh, there are several things that really helped us, right? And I'd like to share two or three of them. One is that you know uh, in the year that we've just finished, we delivered about eighty-five thousand um, training days uh, for about twelve thousand employees. Um, I, earlier, I said 19,000, that includes 7,000 contractors. And 90% of these training days were delivered digitally, right? Uh, so when this thing uh, happened, it was very easy for us to create a playbook for employees on how to work remotely. Uh, and they were able to quickly access it, uh, use it. We were able to create a quick playbook for managers on how to manage uh, and deal with the remote team. And because we're fully digitized, every single one of our employees is, uh, is really on a uh, computer and on the, has access to internet, we created a lot of stuff uh, on a social platform on virtual meetings, right? For example, uh, we got people to do a theme of virtual works, right? And within that, we, people created uh, superheroes as a sub-theme on their own. And people started having meetings dressed as superheroes and superheroines. And I don't know from where did they get all the stuff to where actually uh, the, the costumes, maybe their children's. And, um, you know, it created a lot of fun. Some people said, bring your own children into the meeting. So they created that scene. So I think what this has done is that, you know, generally a manager is usually most of the interaction with the team is about work. What this is doing is every meeting starts by saying, you know, how are you doing? How is the family doing? Are you safe? You know, every, every interaction ends like that. So because we are remote, it is forcing each one of us to engage with the people that we engage with at a more personal and human level, which we usually take for granted, right? And uh, I, I see that this is actually a great thing. And going into the future, managers will be able to develop this much sharper. And I think the, the managers... Uh, who are able to do this well in a in a in a urban and in an authentic manner will really be considered as good managers, and they are the ones who are going to make progress. So I think that's one thing that we have learned. The second thing that we have learned is that while ninety eight percent of employees are working from home, you know we have a global network. Uh, you know, uh, if you see the internet routes, thirty percent of the world network, the internet routes uh, are really run by us. Right, um, our network covers 99.5 percent of the world GDP you know, in terms of the location. Now that network has to be maintained by somebody. So there are lots of employees and lots of other people, which includes the employees of our contractors, who are actually running these essential services um, uh, to to make sure that the network is running. Right, there are hospitals on this. There are other customers on this. You know, customers who are doing uh, you know running the infrastructure using which we are doing virtual meetings. Now, we now realize that how do you take care of them is something that we have uh, you know, not really considered in a big way earlier. So they are the ones you know, who are present where the rubber hits the road. So how do you take care of them and how do you engage them, how do you develop them is something that we have learned uh, that something we need to do better. Uh, so Akhil, back to you and maybe we'll come Thanks, back. Sir. Thank you, Adesh. That is very, very... And we'll, since we're going in alphabetical order, I'll go next. Um, I have two thoughts that when there is disruption, I feel that HR should actually create more disruption. And I'm very serious about it. Because when there is disruption, the receptivity to change is the highest. People have no choice but to accept change. And when that environment is there, any other change that comes goes with the flow. And if the change that the HR, I have two ways of looking at it, that this is the time for HR to uh, do what I call an MBA. Um, and very briefly, maintain certain things. The M part, core values, communication, what Adesh mentioned, connection with the people, making sure connection with the outside world like campuses, uh, uh, recruiters and other service providers must be maintained. Those are the core thing, your reputation, your glass door, your ethics and values are to be protected at any cost, no shortcut. And that is the part HR should focus on now very seriously and very closely. 
The B part is break ruthlessly. We should actually review some of the HR policies and practices that we got used to of all these years and we have sworn by it, got awards for it and being quoted in uh, uh, papers and magazines. I think this is the time to let go some of the hobby horses that we've made us successful. And I'm saying this with a lot of seriousness, that this is a time to review whether those systems are really uh, as effective as we thought. For example, uh, the critical talent list or high potential list and a succession plan. We have a laundry list of people in that list. We keep on adding them every year. One day we will clean it. We never get down to it. This is the time to examine who are the real talent who will help us rebound. And some of the practices like annual appraisal. Why have annual appraisal? Just because it is safe so? Just because XYZ report comes out to say the average industry is 8.5% and we'll give 12% highest people, we'll give 4%. Why not move to quarterly appraisal? And I mean it. At least for time being. And why annual increment? Why predictable increment? Why not profit sharing for time being? Because all the companies will come under tremendous cost pressure. And if these are the things HR should learn to break. And the last part is alignment. You know, many of us have been accused that we do not understand business. We understand PBT, PAT, CAGR to the last decimal point. This is the time to sit with our line managers and understand what they really want. This is important contribution because when the business rebounces, they should come to HR as people who will give us real solution from the people angle and help business revive. So I feel this is a time to maintain certain core things, break ruthlessly, go and create more disruptions, get away with it by breaking it as long as you're objective and very um, sensible, business driven and aligned with business. So that's my thought. And can I now request Mahalakshmi to please come in? Absolutely. It's, it's a tough act to follow you, Dr. Vastrai. But, uh, you know, I mean, if I step back, I think one of life's biggest takeaways for me is uh, never to let a good crisis go waste. Uh, okay. And perhaps, you know, the, the COVID uh, pandemic is perhaps no different. Uh, so if I step back and really look at, you know, uh, the four big takeaways for all of us and our workplaces, perhaps there are four that strike me. First, I mean, I genuinely feel that, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, what's happening today is a bit like a forced pilot of future of work, you know, all of us are into one, uh, it's almost like a video game, we're all into it. And some of the things that we used to talk about and used to think would be coming much into the future has just gotten accelerated. And we are all in that pilot today, uh, whether it's embracing digital, like Adesh mentioned, or working from home, or even experimenting with or reflecting on, you know, what can be skills on demand, where can gig become a real option, etc. So COVID can surely be credited with being a disruptor. Uh, so the first takeaway is really uh, leveraging the future of work and seeing this as a pilot to do a ton of experiments. The second takeaway for us has really been that I think it has really redefined leadership, uh, putting the focus back on gratitude for what we have, putting the focus on humanity so that, you know, I've seen so many people give, uh, give and collaborate today more than ever before. Uh, the focus on agility and growth mindset to survive and, uh, you know, anchoring leaders back to be ambiguity absorbers. Uh, and in many ways, therefore, leadership is getting defined. Thirdly, I think in many ways, uh, you know, this pandemic is forcing the leadership to reimagine business delivery models, focus on what's really critical for the business and move decisions really close to the field. And fourth, it's dynamically teaching all of us to kind of practice this dual focus of focusing on the here and now bounce back plans for today, as well as planning for tomorrow's new normal. So in some ways, for me, four big takeaways really accelerate the future of work. Leadership is completely getting redefined. Uh, business delivery models are getting uh, reimagined and that's a fantastic opportunity. And I think the practice of focusing on the short term and the long term new normal uh, so that our businesses come emerge not only right after, you know, this thing is behind us, but also for the long run, we are reimagining, uh, keeping future of consumer, future of shopper, etc. in mind. I think those are some of the big pieces as I see. Them. Thank you, Ma. Very, very good um, approach that you're taking. We'll learn from you more as we go into Question answer, Ma. Very good approach. Uh, Raj, can I request you, sir, to step in? Thank you, Akhil. And, and I think Adesh and Maha have 
kind of laid the foundation really, really well. Um, firstly, before I start, my heart actually goes out to the doctors, the health workers, the sanitation staff, the policemen on the street, the delivery people, all of them who are actually braving it out on the streets. And many of us are working from the comfort of our homes. Um, and and I, think, I think we should acknowledge, and I really want to acknowledge uh, all that they are going through and doing for the society. Um, that said, uh, I'm not a futurist, um, and I'm, I'm not using any data to predict uh, what could happen in the future. Um, but taking cues from both Adesh, uh, Akhil, heard, having heard you before, and Maha, and my own sense of what has happened, I think there are four things that could change. Um, one thing I think I'll, I'll, I'll see more, and I already see more of that happening, is some kind of activism, you know, social activism or collective bargaining. And uh, this, this will not probably come in the form of unions, but people are going to use social media platforms, uh, in my mind, the Twitters and Facebooks and the Instagrams of the world to be uh, stirring the pot. And oftentimes, we may probably get sidelined by trying to uh, focus on something that comes up there than dealing with a real one. And, and, and I think as leaders, we should be uh, focused on that and, and of course do the right thing and be fair if those commentaries on, on social media are indeed true. The second one, and both uh, Maha and Adesh talked about it, remote working uh, will certainly be a new normal. I'm, I'm in the airline industry. We don't work remotely. You can't have a pilot say, I'm working from home today, right? <laughs> so, so we are getting used to it. I mean, today we are uh, more busy than we ever wa were. My executive committee, we are meeting about three times a week. And that's going to be more and more, I think, of a new normal. And uh, the third one, I think, is, and, and when I speak to young people, young professionals, they are saying, you know what, Raj, I'm not going to take the chances that you guys took with your career. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, we are not going to be just dependent on one career. You've been lucky. You've worked 28 years in HR. Nobody gave you anything else to do. But, but the point is, I'm not going to be able to just sit and say, I'll be an HR person all my life. Uh, for all you know, I may be a HR person working for four different employers at the same time, or probably be a chef, be a musician, be an HR person, and be a football coach all at the same time. So I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. And the fourth and final one, and Maha, you touched about it, on leadership. And, and I'll just make a little twist on that. And I think the death of leadership or leaders without expertise is knocking our doors. Um, there are far too many leaders who foresee future, predict probabilities without really having an expertise into it. And, and I may be a little more critical than I would like to be, but I think this situation now is going to really make leadership a compelling proposition and you better have a specific, specific, uh, you know, critical skill or competence you will bring on your table. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself redundant. These are the four things uh, as my starting point, Akhil. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, I think the point about leadership that both you and Maha alluded to is going to be a cru crucial point when organizations learn to rebound. So, Sukhjit, can I request you now to please step in? Thanks, Akhil. Um, and thanks to Maha, Adesh, and Raj for sharing their viewpoints. Uh, well, I just want to start with saying that uh, definitely it's an unimaginable event in our life. And uh, uh, we couldn't have anticipated, none of us could have anticipated. And especially this is my first, uh, you know, e-digital uh, panel discussion that <laughs> I'm going through. So I couldn't have imagined that, you know, we would be doing a panel discussion like this. Uh, uh, sitting at our uh, at our own uh, homes, but yeah, definitely it's. Uh, uh, I was just doing a post lockdown kind of planning uh, yesterday with my team, and we said if, if the lockdown opens, then what is our readiness for different offices and branches, etc. 
and we all had a similar viewpoint saying that it's not going to be uh, just a restart it's going to be a big big reset for us as we restart you know so there's going to be a lot of change when we open our big offices large offices again to many people coming again to office so uh, definitely it's it's changing our mental models our mental models are being challenged on every account on every account and not only what training uh, thing that adesh mentioned but i think uh, it's going to be uh, something which our honorable prime minister said don't cross the lakshman rekha of your home but i would say we'll have to cross the lakshman rekha of our mental models you know that's something very very important at this moment for all of us in every aspect of hr will have to cross that lakshman rekha we uh, we are asking basic questions to ourselves now is why are we commuting so much to office why are we uh, uh, why do we need gyms for exercise you know so those kind of questions are coming to mind which we had never thought of earlier you know and uh, if we can you know do these things virtually if then i think we don't need just incremental changes now i think it needs major shifts in our way of working and some of the good points that are coming out is as uh, i think one of you mentioned that uh, the the kind of people who are helping us outside policemen uh, the health workers etc so i think new heroes are emerging in our day to day life and uh, these new heroes are telling us uh, how to appreciate them for what they do for us you know in this tough times and our gratitude towards them is increasing you know our, our even a mindset towards them is is changing you know towards these heroes so definitely there's a focus on communities and uh, employees care empathy etc is increasing but at the same time one good thing that i foresee everywhere is that the recognition for climate change that everybody across the world is appreciated mm. and if you see some pictures that are floating on a whatsapp groups you know of ganga getting cleaned or animals and birds moving around and everybody across Uh, many groups is posting those pictures so there is a definitely a you know again a mindset change that probably a climate change is good for us at this moment and this is the way to probably deal with it instead of the way we were dealing it so far so again it's is linked to a mental model that is being you know challenged in a in a day to day life and of course uh, as we see from a workplace point of view again there's a exponential group uh, growth in digital push you know and adesh mentioned about that covid is the new cto for us and making the digital transformation so i think there is a big big digital push in the last 6 weeks exponential towards work from home laptops vpns virtual meetings technology investments mobile first and speed to deliver all this you know what we thought that a budget constraints etc are there to deliver these i think now people are saying no more budget constraints and let's deliver it immediately so i think this is definitely going to be a big big reset for us and not just restart when we open beyond the lockdown good point sanjeev is a rebooting or restart uh, my apology is yash i didn't introduce you so now i have the privilege to both introduce you before i invite you and um, uh, yeah yash uh, mahadev is a, uh, the global hr head for lupin uh, with 30 plus years of experience behind him with colgate palmolive Uh, Johnson uh, and Johnston, Philips in Netherlands, and uh, Sun Pharma, and now with Lupin. Um, I have known Yash from a different angle. He is an outstanding uh, wildlife photographer, um, and um, one of those HR people who have the courage to speak up counterintuitive in a management meeting. So, while apologizing, uh, Yash, to miss. introducing in the first round can i request you to step in and share your view sir no problem uh, akhil that's absolutely all right so you know first of all akhil thank you very much uh, and i totally agree with all the co panelists okay who have said uh, whatever they just presented okay I totally agree with them and i don't want to repeat that okay but uh, if i may add to that and say that what else has changed and what else has changed for the role of uh, the chro or hr in uh, companies is first is akil when this covid crisis uh, started to hit us and when it hit us i mean um, when i called up my colleagues all over the world even in india 
and checked with them. This first realization that I had and many of them had is, I think uh, this crisis has taught the HR leaders, business leaders, how to be adept at crisis management, okay, business continuity. Because so far our business continuity crisis management plans used to always paint scenarios which are disaster scenarios at a local level, okay, such as an earthquake or a nuclear uh, plant leak or, you know, a electricity grid failure. But nobody had imagined a global lockdown like this. And that too for 30 days, okay. It sent many organizations, you know, again, scrambling back to the drawing boards to look at the crisis management, disaster recovery plans, okay. And, and I think there's been a tremendous learning from it. Now, for the industry that I come from, you see, uh, uh, fortunately, because of the industry in which we are, but um, also very, very challenging because we had to keep operating. So when the crisis hit us, our manufacturing, our R&D, our laboratories, our testing clinic has all been working 100%, okay? because we come under the essential services and commodities and globally we had to keep it working except our offices were closed okay and and that that was very challenging because you know you realize that if you have to continue operating the business the way we did in this past 35 40 days you realize that it's not you your industry per se you know your interdependencies are so much okay now, I mean, even if you look at the panelists who are representing the industry here, okay, whether it is Adesh from the communications or Subjeet from, you know, banking or, you know, what we have as uh, uh, the airline and transportation, you know, which is Raj, our dependence in those industries is so high to get material, to send out materials, including the, and, and they had stopped working. So... Making sure that HR, like I've seen many HR people, including myself, we were leading, we were leading through this crisis. Okay. So there was a weekly management committee meeting, a daily senior management uh, meeting and a call which happens. And everyone was looking up to HR and we stepped up and we did that. But loads of learning. I hope we learn from it and, and, and again are not scrambling when a crisis of this kind, God forbid, if it hits us again. The second thing is, you know, I think, I don't know, uh, Akil, but if you have observed and other fellow panelists must have observed, you see, one thing that people realized is it forced collaboration across industries, across fraternities, like doctors sharing data with each other, real time, free, which used to be so guarded. Companies. So, I mean, we have, uh, we have created a, a small but very, very important CHRO group where we are freely sharing each other's woos, problems, and we'll be sharing our exit, uh, lockdown exit plans very free. I don't remember when uh, companies did that collaboratively so well. Okay. And I think this is a very positive and this should stay because otherwise we treat a lot of information as proprietary and confidential, mm -hmm. which actually it isn't. It needs to be uh -huh. shared. So, so, so I think being collaborative, this, if we were not becoming collaborative, the situation has forced us to be collaborative. And mm -hmm. the third thing I'd like to add here, uh, Akhil, it was a huge realization to me and the leaders, and I'm sure to others, is, is how we need to focus big time on health and wellness of our employees. Because health and wellness, I mean, this was a health scare. Okay, this crisis is all about health. And and you have seen the spectrum of health and wellness, which is not related to the COVID virus alone, but people who had comorbidities. So how not to get comorbidities, how people work even at home, okay, looking at screens. There are people who started reporting pains in their eyeballs because of high screen times, okay. There are people who are going through mental wellness issues mm -hmm. and there is no infrastructure. Uh, we realized in India to support them with their mental wellness needs, okay. So a lot of unresolved questions for us as a fraternity, as a community, as a leadership to start. It's not just giving gym membership to your employees, which takes care of health and wellness, not just giving them a health insurance, which takes care of. I think we just have to deeper, uh, go deeper, understand, and really take care of health and wellness of our employees as much as we do of their 
technical capabilities. Okay, the kind of focus that we have on building that we need to bring on health and wellness. So these three would be mine addition to whatever my co-panelists have said. And uh, yeah, with that, I hand it back to you, Akhil. Thank you, Yash. Thank you very much. Um, and if you notice that each one of the panel members have brought in a slightly different angle, but focusing only on one thing, the organization success during and post COVID. And it's not a surprise. I mean, we all uh, in our roles because of doing that. What I would like to do is uh, throw some questions at the panel, be brief, so we can get more views of Sadeep. My first question is, uh, say, Adesh, you started on a very high note about employee engagement and, and knowing your um, experience and expertise in the so-called employee uh, connect. Uh, this employee engagement thing in recent times, is it not being too hyped up? And why were we not talking about this or worried about this pre-COVID? And what is COVID suddenly <laughs> brought a magic that we are concerned about people, we must say hi to them. What's your view, uh, Adesh? See, like we, we, we discussed that, you know, crisis has sharpened some things that were uh, sublime or latent, right? And when a crisis comes and this is new, we are looking at it from a new angle, right? People are raising new demands. So, for example, if by chance you are working from home and your child is knocking on the door, papa, mama, you'd be embarrassed, right? Now, life has joined it together. People actually say, hey, don't worry, don't worry, let your child come, right? <laughs> They're saying, hi, hi, how are you doing, Veda, this, that. Yeah. Now, so I, I think that is such a beautiful thing that the artificial boundaries that we had created, right? We are actually one being. We are playing multiple roles. Inside the integration is already there, but we are just managing it on our own. And there is certain amount of stress and certain amount of embarrassment and artificiality in it. I think that boundary has been broken. So there is more naturalness today. And uh, it's like old friends meeting after a long time saying, how are you? How are you? Right? If you're meeting every day, you don't say, how are you? It's okay. <laughs> it's morning, right? So I, I think it is, it is taking us to the roots and it, it is making it more authentic rather than focusing on the professional work related part of engaging with employees. I think we're engaging at a more deeper level today. Okay, so Maha, you also resonated with what Adesh had mentioned. Uh, my question is, all this lovey-dovey stuff, is it temporary because it is COVID? Or will it continue post and does it have any impact on business, Maha? So I think, uh, you know, reality is there's always a balance between uh, the hard stuff and the soft stuff. Uh, for a moment, let me call it head and heart, uh, you know. Um, and I don't think, uh, I don't think situationally how it manifests perhaps changes. You know, but the reality is that in all our roles as leaders, I think there's always a balance of business continuity, financials, numbers, and you know, some of the hard stuff like structure, right staffing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that all of us will go through. Um, and equally, you know, how do we ensure the spirit is up and, you know, there is a human side, you know, and, and never before have we seen humanity come up so much, you know, people are really wanting to, I mean, to Yash's point, not only collaborate with data, but actually collaborate with the physical infrastructure. I mean, even in FMCG, I mean, we've, we've done so much of sharing of trucks, which take our product to the, you know, to the, to the depots and the retailers job with industries that are utterly unrelated, you know, and there's so many, uh, so many innovative pieces that are coming out today, you know. So, I mean, to my mind, the how changes. Uh, I don't think fundamentally uh, there is anything which is uh, temporary or transient in this. Uh, I think the reality is all of us yearn for that uh, connection. We just find different ways and uh, expressions for it at different times. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, this leads me to my next question. That with all this bonhomie and camaraderie and... Um, good feeling created, what happens if there is a necessity to take a tough call to reduce headcount or reduce number? And, uh, and Yash, I would request you to chip in that, you know, um, I mean, what proactive plan would you suggest we put in if those bad news have to be conveyed and executed? This is serious. Yeah. No, no, absolutely, Akhil. And in fact, uh, that is something which is weighing on the minds of uh, the CHROs and HR heads. And Raj and Mark and uh, 
you know, vet that because, you know, on the CHRO group that we have, these are the questions uh, being discussed and asked. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, if you, if you, if you allow me to present my take on this, well, you know, let's look at it first from what employees are looking at, at this stage and, and what has changed during this crisis. So let's not forget, you know, uh, compared to other nations, India is a non-welfare state. You know, uh, there's no no social welfare in this country. Okay. So when an uh, Indian loses his job, they literally, you know, uh, put the entire security of the family in jeopardy. All right. Um, that's the seriousness. But also, that is what is recognized by the Indian companies a lot. Okay. So therefore, what the Indian companies are saying and doing is, they said that instead of cutting workforce or cutting jobs at this stage, can we all take salary cuts? Can we all, people are making a clarion call for enhancing productivity. Can employees give 200% of what they were given? Then that way you can pull the company out of, you know, uh, the, the curve. Okay, then you can pull it up the curve. That is one way of doing it. Now, that is how the companies and the leaders are thinking, which is tremendous. However, what is it that the employees are looking for? Employees are looking at assurance. They're looking at assurance and transparency. Now, people who have given their life for the company, people who are at different life cycle stages, and people who know that it may be difficult to find an alternate career at this stage, are saying that, guys, can you give me assurance at this stage? So all this lovey-dovey thing, they're not expecting. Let me tell you. They're not expecting you'll get them dressed in a red and make them jump up and down during Christmas anymore. <laughs> okay? Uh, no. They're saying, I don't want to do that. That's fine. Uh, but can you give me assurance? That's what employees are looking at. And then they're also saying, can you be transparent? So that if you think you cannot afford me, then will you give me some notice and not take an action overnight, which will leave me scrambling? All right? So I think that's where we will have to rise to it. Now, I don't think so. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I don't think so. There's going to be a very serious implications of job losses in India as compared to other nations and economies. Okay. I think India is a very buoyant, you know, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, research very, very quickly. But we have to understand one thing, Akhil, which is very, very important. You can't force the industry not to make tough decisions. Otherwise, you'll weaken them. Absolutely. If there is a company and an industry which becomes healthy and stays healthy, then that will provide employment. It's not the other way around. Okay. So, so this is where even the government will have to uh, act, uh, you know, with more care, caution, and, um, and be more sensitive towards the need of the industry. And then the industry leaders, like all of us, we are willing to be very, very responsible very, very sensitive, and we will have to do it in that manner. Yeah. So, yes, you're, you know, in these days when people are talking gloom and doom, uh, your optimism comes out as a refreshing breath of fresh air. And really, uh, because uh, everybody's talking about negativity and not that they're not real, but uh, I hope you are right when you say that India will bounce back and will not have um, sad thing, repeat of um, uh, dot com burst or 2008. But there are certain industries which are already getting impacted. And Raj, I would like to come to you, sir. Uh, you know, in Europe, nine airlines have folded up. Um, people are not going to travel. So hotel industry, airline industry, transport, tourism uh, will be unfortunate victim of this COVID as the front runner. Uh, if, God forbid, bad news has to be conveyed and has to be executed, all this engagement thing actually can bounce. What's your view, sir? No, absolutely right. In fact, uh, global studies have said, Akhil, in, including IATA surveys and CAPA surveys, have said uh, the airline industry is going to lose in the billions. And uh, if you look at uh, data that is coming from internationally, uh, both European, American, as well as in Australia, you're, you're seeing airlines folding up. Uh, Virgin Australia basically has uh, showed notice saying, they have no money. Yeah. And uh, that, is, that is indeed a stark uh, reality that's facing all of us. Now, um, India could be different. But on, on the other hand, China has rebounced. 
the uh, the passenger traffic in china apparently has uh, almost hit their 80% levels that indeed was uh, i think yash is kind of right uh, india has a unique uh, you know uh, uh, strength in all of this i think our domestic consumption will come in handy whether all of this domestic consumption will come in uh, the industries that you just mentioned akil of of transportation travel hospitality uh, a- aviation or all of that it, that's probably not true but uh, in my mind we probably have the strength to handle this a lot more than um, other countries have had having said this um you know many years ago at ge um you know jeff himmel was asked this question because he, he was taking over from jack welch and jack was known to be somebody who would make tough decisions and he had this four e theory i will not go into all of the four e's one of the e's was edge meaning thereby take tough decisions so somebody asked jeff jeff what about edge will you have will you have edge because you you're seen as a more collegial person he said you know what i will have the same edge as jeff with more heart and that was that was i think stupendously well said and that's what was probably going to you know uh, uh, differentiate the also rands from great companies uh, when you're letting go of people or you're doing this thoughtfully or you're giving them the time or you're giving them the the compensation or you're finding opportunities or you're looking at uh, other industries who are hiring or you're doing outplacement services i think this is where hr will come in handy the second thing i think after all of this happens there's going to be a small workforce that's going to work for you they're going to be wondering what are you going to do with me and how are you going to deal with them how will you rebound how will you make sure the energy kind of continues and i think hr's primary role in in all of in doing everything that yash yash said and yash and maha and i are in the same group uh, will be about how do you how do you build resilience how do you make sure employees understand have the mental stability or or courage to deal with this now all of this is easier said than said than done but i think these are some really tough things that will that will keep us uh, you know as a function um you know uh, seen very differently than every other function yeah akil may i make a small uh, uh, bill yes. in this one yeah, it's ma'am. a very small one i think you know fundamentally you know one of the opportunities we have as a function is not wait to execute some of this you know i mean as a function we can pretty much take a pole position uh, which is why i keep talking about head and heart you know so in addition to the heart led pieces some of these head led pieces you know which are really about how do we ensure the cash flow situation and the long term sustainability and the short short term success we can, and we are i think most of us are i think instead of waiting to be told and then go to execute i think there is a big role we can play to help reprioritize how to get some of those savings in the short run and also call out the sheer opportunity cost because you know it's easy to take a short term view which may be about impacting that roles and talents point, but the cost of there yeah, the cost of rehire or the cost of reskilling is tremendous good. and i think that's a very important one to very kind good. of very good point ma there's a good interjection uh, adesh coming to you uh, you know right now if you look at all the response we are discussing and the ideas we are discussing actually is for large multinational big corporation deep pockets what is the small scale medium sized companies who have actually no cash flow who have to depend on day to day running of a company how do you foresee those that particular sector coping with this uh, uh, crunch i think in the short term they are going to be hit hard right because um you know they don't they really have the 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 big infrastructure the big pockets right but you know what we have to remember is that they are run by entrepreneurs right mm-hmm. and entrepreneurs you know unlike uh, us managers they they i think are much more driven they are much more ambitious they are much more hard nosed and they will figure out a way to get out of this right and um i think that's point number one point number two is i think as government we need to you know governments need to think about how are we going to help them and enable them right so for example uh, we have offices in 40 countries now in three countries 
the local governments, right? In, I mean, in those countries where the lockdowns have happened, using a certain criteria, they are reimbursing a part of the salaries of employees to the company, right? Uh, uh, you have to agree on certain conditions that you're not going to do a layoff, this, that, whatever. And I think that's something that we can consider uh, as a country, right? Good so point. rather than just government asking that don't let people go, keep paying their full salary. Yes, I think it's, I think most companies can do it for one, two, three months, right? But if it is going to become longer, then the government needs to come and step in. So mm -hmm. like, like we were saying, you know, we will stop hiring new people. Uh, maybe we will not give salary increase. Uh, we'll increase productivity so that we don't have to fire people, right? Uh, we will do salary cuts. Uh, but on top, and we'll increase productivity. But can we also say that government is going to pay X percent of 1%, 2%, 5%, whatever that number might be, to really help the companies that are in real trouble? Need, no need to help everyone, but can we identify some sectors, some companies where the government will help? That's a good point, Adesh, because like even like countries like Bangladesh have extended 75% of wage bill as loan to select companies to be repaid after 24 months at 2% interest. Yes. Uh, Sukhjit, coming to you, sir. Uh, um, what do you see is the re rebounds likely to happen and what plans are likely to be put in place? It also, because banks will play a very major role in rebounds of industries. Any views on what plans could be put up or what is being put up? See, uh, Akhil, uh, we, for our internal employees, I can definitely talk about right now. And of course, there is a lot of other things that you hear in uh, external world about how banks are helping uh, customers. But uh, for in internal employees, definitely we have a 4C strategy and similarly, uh, at the customer angle also we have that one uh, we started we all know we talked about engagement or etc we, we talked about care for employees so first C is definitely a lot of care for our internal people and the customers and of course the uh, you know even uh, looking at the way customers uh, are being helped in this uh, in this scenario for example there are mobile ATM vans reaching uh, the build, buildings to you know help people dispense their uh, cash from the ATMs just below their uh, house you know so that is the kind of help that is happening on the external side so there's a lot of care being extended internally and externally similarly the second C is a lot of communication with the customers happening right now and the number of hours getting changed uh, how and similarly internally uh, what are the what are the kind of you know care that people have to take care of in terms of health and safety of the family members. And then there's a lot of communication that flows to them through mobile, through uh, WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, communication of protocols that they have to follow while at home or, or while working in branches, et cetera. The third C, as everybody spoke about, is continuity. And uh, continuity, I think, is definitely being challenged again beyond BCP plans that we already had in place. So we are thinking of you know, uh, it's, nobody thought about this adversity being part of, you know, BCP. So there is a big shift again or a big plus plus being added to uh, continuity plans uh, with, with this new scenario that is that is emerged. And the fourth, of course, uh, is cost, you know. And uh, everybody, I'm sure, is recalibrating their priorities, recalibrating their costs uh, and uh, looking at, you know, challenging as to why do we need this and why do we why can't we prioritize this as compared to that you know so these four c's are being looked at internally as well as externally you know for managing uh, both kind of customers coming very systematic Sukhjit, and i'm not surprised having known you for so many years that systematic approach and i like the four c easy to remember very quickly <laughs> a very short answer uh, yash what is the biggest lesson you have learned so uh, the biggest uh, lesson, you know, I mean, at least to me, is, uh, is, is, is how valuable our social connections and contacts are. Okay. It's a big mm -hmm. lesson. Right? That, that is like? the biggest lesson to me. Thank you. Uh, because this lockdown has forced us to stay at home. And, you know, some of us are privileged uh, to have lovely families and beautiful homes. But even then, you know, you feel you're getting into the space, et cetera. That's one. Raj, what have you learned, sir? Uh, for me, um, I'm, I'm staying fit. 
Um, I've done uh, 12,000 steps on an average the last 35 days. Um, I'm reading. Um, I'm cleaning homes. I've, I've now graduated from cleaning toilets to cleaning the uh, living room. So uh, <laughs> you, are, you got promoted. And, I got you know, promoted. You, yeah. And was this part of your plan to make us feel guilty about walking 1,200 uh, steps? No, well, I still clean the toilet, so I don't think that helps. <laughs> yeah. Maha, what is your learning, ma'am? I think gratitude, uh, Akhil. Gratitude. You know, gratitude for what we have and for our collaborations. And Adesh, you learned anything new? Yes, so, you know, despite being so busy, you know, uh, for the last few years, uh, I wasn't doing as much community service that I used to do earlier. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I used to do 30, 40 hours a, a, a month earlier and last few years stopped because of travel. Now I'm more busy than ever, but I'm still doing about uh, 30 hours of community oh. service sitting at home. Conducting meditation, conducting happiness programs. Uh, I must have done meditation sessions for 3,000 people so far. Mm. But I think there's always time for us to be able to contribute. So that's been my big, big learning. Okay. So, Jit, anything that you learned? Yeah, my biggest learning has been, I think we can uh, avoid many things to help climate uh, undergo a change. Okay, as we close, in less than five words, what's your mantra for post-COVID revival? Yes, less than five words, sir. Uh, be, uh, brave, be brave and don't fear. And don't fear. Adesh. Take care of everyone around. Take care of everyone around. Okay, one word extra. Chalega. Hmm. Raj? <laughs> Raj? Be thoughtful. Be thoughtful when taking people actions. Okay, we'll come back. Maha. I'll do one word. Reimagine. Reimagine. What a beautiful word. If you just hmm. put reimagine, everything would fit in. Beautiful word. Very well. Sukjit? So something similar to what you said, MBA, break break ruthlessly. So challenge every paradigm. Well, thank you. You know, one thing that came out very clearly, and I'm not trying to um, just say our formality, that each one of you have your heart in the right place. At the same time, you are blessed with head in the right place because you're thinking of business, revival, how to make the business successful. And I only hope the audience would find it useful. And, this, and thank you, each one. Uh, uh, Yash, Adesh, Subhjit, Maha, Raj. And team ETHR for giving us this opportunity to share our views. Um, and thank you very much for the time you have spent.